Good evening. Well, I think we can now say quite definitely that Hale Bob is a great comet, the best for very many years. You can see it now in the southern sky at least two hours before sunrise, and it's pretty bright. The magnitude is not far below one. Early on this month, it was uh, in Aquila, not far from Altair, and it's now tracking upwards. It's now reached Cygnus, exactly there, and then over the next few weeks, it'll get further and further north and enter the evening sky and enter Andromeda. Well, uh, here's a naked eye drawing of it made by Paul Doherty. You can see there the nucleus and the tails. And he also drew the nucleus with a six inch telescope. And you can see there active jets. So there's a great deal of activity going on in this comet. And here is a truly magnificent picture taken by Martin Mobley. And there we see the comet in all its glory. Note the reddish dust tail curving downwards and the long straight gas tail. Certainly a superb spectacle and we're going to have it to enjoy now for several weeks in the future. But for this evening's main theme, I want to go right outside the solar system. We know that our sun is one of 100,000 million stars in our star system or galaxy. And far away in space, so remote that light takes many millions of years to reach us, we see other galaxies, such as that one in the constellation of Leo. But we also know the universe is expanding. All the galaxies beyond our local group are racing away from each other. So how do we measure their distances? This is done by means of the spectroscope. If an object is moving away, then further and fewer light waves per second will enter our eyes than would otherwise be the case, and the object appears slightly reddened. And this shows up in the spectrum. All the spectral lines are red shifted. Now we know the universe is expanding, and the further away the galaxies are, the faster they are going. So what we do is to measure the red shifts, that tells us the recessional speed, and from that we can obtain the distance and certainly the galaxies are a long, long way away. But now, there are very important results from radio astronomy. Radio astronomy really began in the early 1930s with some work by Carl Jansky in America. Using an improvised aerial, he suddenly found he was picking up radio waves from the Milky Way. And since then, we built huge radio telescopes. I think most people know this one, the Lovell Telescope, a Jodrell Bank in Cheshire with a 250-foot dish. But at a very early stage in radio astronomy, something very curious emerged. You might imagine radio sources would be concentrated in things like bright stars, but they weren't. Bright stars appeared to be very quiet at radio range. In fact, the radio sources were either fairly faint things, or in some cases, nothing at all. Then, in the early 1960s, astronomers at the Parkes Radio Astronomy Observatory in New South Wales, using that great telescope, identified the position of one strong radio source, 3C273. And there's an optical picture of it over the left-hand side. It's by no means bright. And they then proceeded to take an optical spectrum. Now, they expected this would be a star, but it wasn't. They sent the spectrum over to Palomar Observatory, where Martin Schmidt had a long, hard look at it. And he found this object was not a star at all, something very much more dramatic. There was a tremendous redshift, that meant it was a very long way away. It also meant it was extremely powerful, far more powerful than an ordinary galaxy, and yet it looked small. What was it? This was the first quasar. Since then, thousands of quasars have been found, and they are so luminous we can see them over at, at immense distances. But have we reached the limit? Are there any quasars further away than those we've actually tracked? This is the great problem now. It's been a fundamental research, and the one astronomer who's deeply involved is Dr. Jasper Wall, director of the Royal Venice Observatory. Jasper, welcome to the sky at night. First of all, let's go back to square one. What exactly is a quasar? A quasar is a superluminous nucleus, uh, a giant galaxy. And uh, what is actually happening, what we believe is happening with a quasar, is that we have black holes at the center of giant galaxies. And as you know, we can't actually see black holes. They trap light. But what black holes do is something extremely ferocious. They create an accretion disk uh, as they draw material in. And as they draw the material in and it forms this accretion disk, the material lights up because of immense energies uh, added uh, as, as the falling in process takes place. So these nuclei shine very brightly, so brightly, that they dominate the galaxies in which they're embedded. Now, uh, there are a number of, of strands which lead us to um, believe strongly in this story, and one is that when we map these objects in, in the radio with 
uh, the superb large radio telescopes we have nowadays, such as Merlin, we, uh, we see um, jets emerging from the center of these structures, uh, which add strength to the story of a, of a rotating uh, accretion disk. We also believe uh, in the, uh, the, the nucleus of active galaxies story from the point of view of being able to see the galaxies which actually underlie the quasars. And thanks to uh, the superb uh, Hubble Space Telescope, for example, we can see a complete range of different galaxy types which are acting as the hosts of these uh, superactive uh, nuclei. Now, the black hole story goes on and gets even better in that uh, in nearby galaxies, uh, recently the Hubble Space Telescope has also detected very uh, extreme concentrations of light to the center and the whirling motions in the nearby stars, which indicate that even galaxies nearby have black holes at the center, although these are essentially quasars which have died. They're not shining like quasars anymore. We know that these things are immensely remote, but are we absolutely sure that the distance values we're giving now are of the right order? We can be sure of that from a couple of arguments, I think, Patrick. One is that the, the fuzz around quasars, the galaxies hosting quasars, um, we are, are now able to take spectra of that fuzz away from the quasar yes. itself. Yes. <clears throat> we can see that that fuzz has the same redshift as the quasar. It is the stars um, in the galaxy holding the quasar. And the other thing we can do is to see faint galaxies around quasars, to take their redshifts and to discover that their redshifts are at the same redshift uh, as the quasar. And therefore, what we're looking at is a cluster of galaxies in which the quasar is situated as one but superactive galaxy in that grouping. How do you track and identify quasars? If we are just considering radio quasars, and as you know, um, there are quasars which oh, yes. are non-radioactive. Oh, yes. If we just consider the radio quasars, then a simple way of doing this is to scan the sky with a telescope such as Parkes, to take a complete survey of the sky, a complete catalog yeah. of the radio sources in the sky, to pick out from that catalog uh, the radio sources which have a particular uh, structure, which are flat, what we call flat spectrum radio sources, and which therefore have a very compact structure. And then we measure the positions of those um, uh, particular radio sources with the very big radio telescopes, such as the uh, VLA, a very large array, or the uh, Australia telescope, which enable us, with their enormous resolving powers, to obtain very precise positions, much more precise than could be obtained in the original sky, uh, sky survey. Yes. We get those very accurate positions, and then we go to the results of the sky surveys carried out by telescopes such as the UK Schmidt. And we can now uh, access digitized databases of all those sky surveys. The plates have been digitized, and the uh, resulting uh, fields uh, are, are such that we can do a, an electronic search, placing the radio coordinate directly on the, the digitized picture from the, the deep plates. And for, for flat spectrum radio sources, almost invariably, we discover a quasar, a coincident in position on these blue plates with the, the radio coordinate. Um, but the interest comes from, from our point of view when you don't see yes. any uh, coincident optical image, when the radio source shows absolutely nothing. And that's when we get really quite excited. Uh, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> the reason we get excited is because the spectrum of distant radios, of distant quasars, is redshifted, as you have described, such that very little of its light, wh when the quasar has a high redshift, very little proportion of its light comes out at blue wavelengths. But lots of it comes out at very red wavelengths. Uh, and therefore, we might expect a very high redshift quasar not to appear at all on these uh, blue UK Schmidt plates. Nice. When we have compiled a list of such uh, empty field objects, as we call them, objects which we can't see yeah. uh, on the UK Schmidt plate, we then go to the European Southern Observatory 3.6 meter telescope, La Silla in Chile. Yes. Superb site. Yes, it is. Um, we, 
We go there to use a camera which enables us to take a deep image in the red. Uh, and our excitement mounts. If the image in the red shows uh, a stellar object at the radio position, which wasn't there in the blue, we know then we've got a very red object, very red stellar object, which could be a high redshift quasar. The camera is so versatile that we can switch it over uh, in, in, in uh, the course of the observations to take a, a, a spectrum, use it as a spectrograph, uh, and to reveal immediately uh, to us as to whether we have indeed got a high redshift quasar on our hands. How far out have you gone? What are the most remote quasars you've detected so far? Well, this, this brings me to the, the sample that we have been working on. It's about 900 radio sources from the Parkes Southern Survey. And uh, out of that 900, we found about 200, which excited us in the sense of them not being identified on the UK Schmidt blue plates. And we took, this is, this is the sample of 200 that we took to ESO. And out of those 200, we only found one that had a redshift greater than four. Uh, and that was Parks 1251 minus 407, telephone number um, <laughs> as these are. But that object had a redshift of 4.46, and that was the highest redshift to be found in our sample. And that's a very long way away indeed, isn't it? When we try and uh, translate that into absolute terms, then, of course, we come across this problem of the, of the Hubble constant, don't we? Again, named after Webb and Hubble. And that is the rate at which the galaxies are moving away from each other. We're not quite certain what the value of the Hubble constant is. But some time ago, we had the Hipparchos astrometric satellite, which measures the position very accurately. I understand that you're now analyzing those results and have come to some very interesting conclusions. Yes, indeed. Um, Mike Feast and Robin Catchpole have, have recently analyzed some of the Hipparchus data <coughs> and have discovered that one of the fundamental stepping stones in the process of defining the scale of the nearby universe was not co quite correct. It was 10% wrong. Um, the steps by which one builds up the, the distance scale to get uh, the scale out to the nearby galaxies and hence to the distant galaxies is one which involves quite a large number of understanding of various different so-called standard candles that we can see further and further out. The Cepheid the, variables. The Cepheid variables are one of those standard steps, and it's those uh, that Mike Feast and Robin Catchpole have recalibrated using Hipparchos data to get more accurate uh, parallax measurements and more accurate distance measurements. And they have discovered that the Hubble constant is about 10% smaller than was thought, and the universe is therefore about 10% larger than we had thought. So in fact, the Cepheid variables are rather more luminous than expected, therefore they're further away, therefore the universe is bigger than we thought. Now, but what about the age? We are talking about 15,000 million years, the universe as we know it. Is that still valid? That is still valid. Uh, it it uh, has this uncertainty uh, of the Hubble constant still on it, and it has another uncertainty, and that is to, to work out under uh, Einstein general relativity geometry as to just what that age should be for that Hubble constant requires a knowledge of how much mass there is in the universe. Uh, and we don't quite know the answer to that either. Now, one thing I think is extraordinarily important. You say you've not detected any quasars further away than the two you've just mentioned. Now, what does that mean? This is the most interesting aspect of our study. We, we managed to identify all 900 radio sources with optical objects for which we can either measure redshifts and have measured redshifts, or for which we can estimate redshifts. And the results are extraordinary in the sense that if we, if we plot the, the, the density of objects we find in space as a, as a function of redshift, if we, if we simply look at how the objects run with redshift, we find that there is an enormous bulge of objects at redshifts between two and, and four. Uh, and there's a great dearth of objects near us and a great dearth of objects, apparent dearth of objects, at, at larger redshifts. Let me act as devil's advocate for a moment. Can it be that the remote quasars really are there, but we can't see them because they're hidden by dust? After all, our universe is a decidedly dusty place. Patrick, you're absolutely right to be worried about that issue, and that's a driving um, motivation for this survey. We, uh, we know that the radio cannot be uh, attenuated by the dust. Now, previous studies of quasar space distribution have used optical surveys. Yeah. Quasars selected from, uh, from the optical plates. 
uh, and these, of course, are, are highly prone to your criticism. Yeah. There could be this veil coming yes, down ma'am. and cutting off the view uh, of these optical quasars from our uh, uh, telescopes. However, you can't say that for the radio because radio emission comes straight through dust. It doesn't know anything about it. And what we have done with this sample is find a, an optical counterpart for every one of the radio sources. Uh, and therefore, there is no way that dust is affecting the conclusions from this sample. What you're really saying is that because you're not seeing any quasars further out than the ones you would describe, there aren't any. There aren't any indeed. Now, in that case, really, we're looking back into the dark ages and the very early stages of the universe before the stars and galaxies were formed. Yes, indeed. Um, and this is um, something which the Hubble Space Telescope has, has recently been carrying through uh, as well in an attempt to see the most distant, uh, the most distant epochs. The uh, very deep image that the Hubble Deep Field uh, uh, observation uh, constitutes takes us down to about magnitude 30. And that, uh, that image has been analyzed by Madau and, and collaborators uh, with the result that it appears star-forming activity, star-forming activity in distant galaxies follows the same track in terms of space density as our uh, calculations indicate that the, the radio quasars uh, follow. The same redshift cutoff, the same, uh, the same picture uh, entirely. And this suggests something to do with fueling of galaxies for star formation as well as fueling the black holes to produce the quasar phenomenon might be one and the same thing. Right back into the very earliest, uh, earliest stages, I just wonder, what does that tell us about the actual origin of the universe itself? The clues will come, but I think the, the key thing to come out of this study is the accurate definition of the epoch in our universe when indeed the, the galaxies came into being as structures. If we take our picture of the, of the space density, which shows the big bulge uh, at a redshift of, of two and a fall off at a redshift of four, and transform that by mapping the, the redshift axis into a time of looking back towards the origin of the universe, and we change the other axis from a logarithmic scale, powers of 10, to a linear scale, we discover that we have a picture of activity in the universe which shows a very sharp peak back at redshifts of about three and drops off like a stone subsequently. And that indicates that the epoch of galaxy formation the epoch at which the quasars began to shine is cleanly and clearly defined. And the amount of time which the universe had to create galaxies from its beginning to that peak is well represented and one which should give the theorists something to really get their teeth into in terms of this serious problem of galaxy formation. Well, we may not have the answer to the origin of the universe, but at least we're learning more all the time. Jasper, thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Don't forget. If you want the latest astronomical information, call up our information line, 0891 80030, or dial CFAX, page 620. And when I come back next month, we're going to come right inside the solar system. I'm going to be joined by Dr. John James. We're going to talk about the zodiacal light, that strange glow. But meanwhile, please don't forget Comet Hale Bob. There it is in the morning sky now. It's a lovely comet. Make the most of it. It'll be on view for several weeks yet. And if you miss it, You've got to wait 4,000 years for another chance. Good night.